Welcome to Net Day. This is number 14, I believe. Uh, my name is Mike Bedell. I'm Dean of the College of Business and Technology. Uh, Net, of course, stands for Northeastern Empowerment Through Technology. And day is about today. So uh, so welcome to Net Day. Uh, we hope we have a uh, uh, an intriguing program for you, something that's forward-looking and thoughtful and uh you know, grabs uh, the leading edge. And so that that's really the purpose. Um, you know, I want to thank the various faculty that uh, have been involved in this in putting this together. There's a faculty committee, uh, Dave Jordan, who you met, Tung Koo, who's over here, uh, Ahmed Khalid in the back, and, and some others that I'm missing at this point. Um, but, you know, again, thank those faculty for putting this together. Um, I hope you guys have a great day. And, uh, it's thoughtful and do not hesitate to talk to these folks, you know, ask questions during, ask questions after, you know, that's how you're going to learn. So, uh, you know, thanks uh, for being here. Have a great day. So AI cyber awareness and cyber awareness and jobs for the future. So uh, uh, Greg has been in cybersecurity for 25 years joining at McFay in 1998, achieving success with antivirus and firewall sales for six years. Greg moved on to work at several uh, tech startups, joining ISSA. I don't know how many people have heard of ISSA. ISSA stands for Information System Security Association. Okay, so uh, Greg joined um, ISSA in 2008, and he's on the board for two Stinks and uh, is now vice president for ISSA Chicago chapter. Greg had additional success at Cisco working in Ironport, one of the first email security uh, gateway solutions. He has been on the software, hardware, and service, service sides of the business for the past 20 years. Joining Splunk in 2021, Greg uh, pivoted from sales to security advisor working with strategic customers throughout the Midwest. He's also very active with the Chicago cyber leadership community. When not slaying threat actors and helping companies mitigate cyber incidents, Greg enjoys time with family, traveling, music, good food, and wine tasting. Now let's we welcome uh, Greg for uh, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Since he finished on wine tasting, maybe I'll talk about that first. I actually thought when I came in that the stage outside with the uh, singing, the karaoke singing was for me, but I'm not very good at singing. So as Yi Wei said, I've been in the industry for about 20, for about 25 years, and uh, I know I don't look that old, but um, I've been uh, doing this for a long time and worked for a variety of different companies. Um, as a security advisor at Splunk, I help both customers as well as internal people understanding security, what's going on with the current landscape, current threats, and solutions that are available for companies to hopefully prevent uh, cyber problems from happening. As uh, Ji Wei mentioned, um, I also uh, have been with ISSA for eight years and uh, currently a vice president of a chapter. For those of you that are not familiar with it, it's an industry organization. I highly encourage you outside of school to get involved with different clubs. Um, do volunteer work, but also participate in certain industry organizations. It's a great way to meet people, to network, to learn and fulfill uh, different educational requirements. But it's a great way, as I said, to network and hopefully find your future job. Um, I enjoy bicycling and uh, skiing, and uh, so I try to keep busy. And uh, it's also important to have other aspirations besides just your work life. Um, so I, I grew up in the 1970s and 80s. So for those of you that uh, are familiar with music, I happen to really enjoy that music from that time. And not that new music isn't good, but uh, I'm a big fan of uh, older music. So my kids call it oldies, but for me, it's it seemed like yesterday. Um, and uh, I joined a lot of clubs and uh, uh, participated in a lot of sports. So it was a good way to meet people and get used to uh, participating in group settings and things like that, but also collaborative skills. So you'll see a little bit later in the presentation, the importance of collaboration and working with other people, networking and uh, finding your passion. 
I, uh, I'm not a native to Chicago. I don't know how many of you were born and raised in Chicago. I was not. I moved here in 1990. So uh, I've gotten to know the city and the surrounding area very well. But uh, if you have questions about things to do in Chicago, especially uh, fun things, let me know. Happy to help you out with that. Um, the other thing is I changed careers. So um, one thing that I learned is regardless of what you're studying, whatever you're doing right now, whatever you're doing five years from now, chances are 10 years from now, 15 years, 20 years from now, you'll probably be doing something different. So whatever your long-term goals are or your short-term goals are, don't think that that's the only thing that's out there. There are a lot of other opportunities for you. And hopefully after this discussion, you'll you'll see uh, some interesting ways to find new ways, uh, new interests that you may not already realize. So how many of you were at the sessions earlier today? So I won't go into definitions of things too much. So you're all familiar with what AI is, artificial intelligence, right? Um, when I was uh, learning about this, let's just say 10 years ago, it was probably more than that. But 10 years ago, we called it machine learning. So anyone that uses Google and uses any type of search engine or whatever, that's basically that was basically early AI. It was machine learning, not only for you to put in whatever uh, searches that you were trying to do, but the algorithms would crank back information, hopefully that aligned to what you were looking for. If not, you'd have to do additional searches and things like that. But it was using that same basic uh, algorithm and machine, uh, uh, big data learning. And so it's evolved to the point where now the machines can learn by themselves. Um, cyber awareness, most of you are familiar with cybersecurity? Any of you hackers? Any of you want to admit that you are? Okay. That's how a lot of people actually got into my industry. So it's not something to be ashamed of, but it's something that you learn. It's a good way to learn. Um, and there's also good ways to use hacking skills. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the ethics of AI, jobs for the future, and where do you go from here? So just real quickly, for those of you that weren't in the session earlier, any of the sessions earlier, artificial intelligence, as I said, machine learning is the ability of a computer or robot to perform tasks commonly associated with people or humans. Um, but machines are now learning to do things themselves. What uh, a lot of organizations and companies are finding is that they don't always give the right information. So when a person does it, we call it lying. When a machine does it, they call it something different, but it's basically the same thing. It's making up an answer that you think is right. And hopefully it is. And you as the person have to go and vet it and make sure that it is indeed giving you the right information. I think they call it hallucination. Cyber awareness. Um, so cyber is, are threats that are happening in the, in the, let's call it the digital space, right? Um, but uh, cyber awareness is being mindful of what you have what the tools are that you have, but also uh, the, your day-to-day -day operations. So a lot of you uh, may or may not, or let me just ask this. How many of you are technology students? That could be computer science, engineering. Okay, about two-thirds. Almost everyone over here. Anyone on this side not a computer science major or engineering? Okay. On this side, um, what other majors do some of you have that are not computer science or engineering? Finance? Okay. Business? Accounting, good. Any others? I'm, I met someone outside who's a psychology major. So um, any of those uh, disciplines, educational areas, are great ways to get into our industry. It's not just for computer science, technology, and engineering students. Um, so uh, it's really important to know what your vulnerabilities are when it comes to technology that you're using. It's also important to know if you're working with accounting systems or you're working in business world or you're, uh, you're doing other types of things with uh, um, whatever your business is to know what the threats are and to be able to protect against them. Um, and then ethics is just moral disciplines. You know, I mentioned how many of you are, are hackers, and I said that somewhat jokingly, but if you know how to do it, you can also know how to prevent it. So it's kind of like uh, being able to take a car apart and put it back together. Just because you took the car apart doesn't isn't a bad thing as long as you learn how to put it back together. And it's the same in, in our world. Um, we'll talk a little bit about jobs for the future. And uh, I don't have 50 slides, so it's going to be pretty painless. Um, this is just to go over a, a little bit more about cyber awareness. Uh, but this happens to be Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Any of you know that? October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So it's a time for a lot of organizations, companies, businesses, schools to practice and to train people about how to use technology safely and how to not leave your laptop 
sitting on the side, how to not leave your phone sitting somewhere, how to make sure that you have either a password or some other type of way of locking your technology so someone can't just take it. Um, and then uh, it's backed by a couple of big uh, government organizations such as CISA. We happen to have had the uh, former director of CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency here in Chicago about two weeks ago, giving a presentation. It was quite fascinating about what's going on globally can affect people and companies and organizations here in the States. So hackers can be anywhere. They don't have to be in your backyard. They don't have to be in your city. They could be anywhere in the world and sitting in an apartment or a house or a coffee shop somewhere and doing what they're doing. And whether that's to uh, issue any type of ransomware or any type of hack, it can be done from anywhere. But likewise, we can find people anywhere. So um, it's really important to know how to protect yourself, but also that there are people watching, not just government agencies, but uh, a lot of corporations are looking to find out who's doing these things and either ask them to stop, which is the nice way of doing it, or taking other type of action. Um, the last thing is, uh, as it says in the bottom bullet, is as business leaders, educators, and even parents, I don't know if any of you have children, but uh, teaching kids that are now using technology at earlier ages, whether it's a handheld game, whether it's a cell phone, uh, teaching them how to use it responsibly as well so that they don't surf in appropriate places, but also that they don't lock someone's phone by mistake, delete something that was important to mom and dad, or, or to uh, use it for uh, unintended purposes. Why people use AI. Um, it's pretty obvious. Um, it is very fast. It can do things 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It doesn't have to sleep. It doesn't have to eat. It doesn't have to drink. I've got two drinks up here just in case. Um, so at a certain point, a machine's going to be able to do this as well. Um, probably not as well as I do. Uh, but uh, it's not just an efficient tool, but uh, also can do really interesting data analysis. I happen to work for a company that uh, works with large data and data modeling and things like that. But uh, it's amazing how quickly machines can do things that for people would take hours or days or weeks. And we have uh, one solution that can do what normally takes about three days in about a minute, sometimes in 20 seconds. But it's amazing how quick it can do it because it's all digital and can cipher through things really, really quickly. As I said, it's available 24 by 7, can com solve complex problems. What I'm hoping is that we can use AI for really cool things like solving um, medical, uh, finding cures for different illnesses, whether it be cancer, whether it's uh, how to do surgeries more efficiently. It's still gonna need people to help out with that, but um, if it could come up with ways of finding the next cure for um, brain cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, I think it would be amazing. Um, and then it can also help improve education. I know uh, some teachers ask you not to use AI, ChatGPT, or, or BARD, or any of those things, but it's a good way to help you learn as well, as long as you still personalize uh, the work that you do, or use it as a tool, as another data source, if you will, but uh, it's important to learn how to do a lot of these things yourself, but uh, using technology to help augment that is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, as I mentioned, there's good and bad, so um, I think it'll make all of us more efficient, um, will help with new discoveries, as I said, healthcare and medical cures, uh, but there's some belief that it will also eliminate jobs. And since a lot of you are going to school right now, you're concerned about what am I gonna do after school? You know, Where am I gonna work? What am I gonna do? So you're gonna wanna find jobs that don't uh, necessarily have repetitive tasks or things that a machine can do easily. Um, find things that are very unique that people can help um, improve. Um, and you'll see in a couple of slides, some of those ideas that I have. Um, in the wrong hands, AI can do a lot of disastrous things. It could shut down systems, um, and that's not just computers, but it could shut down, for example, um, gas pipelines so you don't have heat in your house. It could shut down electric electrical grids. It could do things to the water system, the sewer system. It could do things to airplanes, boats, all kinds of things. In fact, one guy I know, again, started out as a hacker, um, was on an airplane and uh, using his phone and his laptop was able to hack into the cockpit. And he didn't do anything to the controls. He didn't do anything weird. He just spoke to the pilots and, and said, I don't know if you're aware, but your cockpit communications is not secure. He thought he was doing them a favor, but turns out that what he was doing was inappropriate. And when he got off the plane, he was greeted by some federal agents and it was, 
don't remember how many years ago, let's just say a number of years ago, he's not allowed on several major airlines still because of what he did. Didn't do anything to the plane, just told them that there was a flaw in their system. So uh, he now drives all over the place, but there are a couple of airlines that still let him on. Um, and then uh, I was at another conference uh, with a company that makes tractors and uh, farm equipment. I won't mention their name either, but they are putting all kinds of interesting AI technologies, but also um, cyber tools into their tractors and, and combines and other things, because a lot of these things have some really cool computerized technology, not only to help the vehicle move through the fields, but can also do assessments of the soil, the water conditions, the seeds, all those things. And it crunches all that data together to say, what is the optimal amount of seeds per acre? What is the optimal amount of water? That we need what is the amount of fertilizer that we need what is the weather going to be like for the next five days or ten days so that they can make all these predictions so if it's going to rain in two days you really need to water the plants that much all this is being done digitally so uh, again that could be used really badly it could say let's put too much fertilizer on things let's not put it, too many seeds there so that uh, they're not as efficient so there's a lot of interesting things to do the other thing is um, we have to make sure that if we're using this technology, we have to do it safely and do it responsibly. And that's where the ethics come in as well as how do we use this technology for good purposes and not use it for uh, bad purposes. Um, again, just uh, assessing the, resp the responsibility aspect of AI uh, to measure the pluses and minuses or pros and cons of the technology um, and how to use it responsibly. Um, there's some talk that maybe only certain people should be able to use artificial intelligence. Maybe it should only be um, government people. Maybe it should only be medical people. Maybe it should only be researchers. But I think everyone should be able to use it as long as they realize that there's a lot of good things you can do with it, but there's some bad things. So uh, I do think we should probably have some limitations or guardrails, but I don't think we need laws against it. I don't think we need to limit its use. We just need to let people know that there's good and bad ways and we prefer people to not use it for the bad ways and to teach ethical ways. As I said, with, with children, um, I happen to have children that are probably about your age. Um, they're teaching me things, but when they were younger, we tried to teach them right from wrong. And it's the same with technology. You know, if you're having a cell phone and using technology, you should probably be able to um, teach them how to do all of this safely. Um, it's also great to be able to use to solve problems, complex mathematical problems, weather problems, uh, forecasting of weather, fo forecasting of hurricanes, all those things. So there's a lot of interesting ways. In fact, one person I was speaking to about a year ago works for NOAA. I don't know if any of you know, know what NOAA is, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. So it's the organization that has satellites in space that keep track of weather and everything. And they've got six or so of them going uh, in space all the time, and they communicate with each other to look at different weather patterns and things like that. So if a hurricane is happening, for example, in the Caribbean or the South Pacific or in Asia, they can warn people that live in those places and determine the severity of it, et cetera. Um, cyber awareness, we were talking a little bit about uh, different ways the technology is being used. Um, everyone always thinks of it as computer, uh, but as I said, most of you are walking around with a computer either in your pocket, your purse, or on your, on your person. Um, and this thing can do more than what a supercomputer could do 30 years ago. So it's amazing the technology that you have at your fingertips, not just to access information, but cool things that you can do. Um, so make sure that uh, you're aware of that to not use it uh, inappropriately. But if you get spam or phishing attacks, are you familiar with those things? Uh, if you get those, if some someone is asking you for something, you probably want to know what the source is. You don't want to click on links unnecessarily. You want to make sure that uh, whoever is sending you a text message saying, you know, send me a gift card or, or doing other things that uh, you know who that person is. And if they're asking you for something that seems inappropriate or for a professor or someone is asking you for something that doesn't seem right, probably better to reach out to them directly rather than just click on, um, on what you have and uh, respond to it. The other thing, because you're all young, you probably know a lot of these things anyway, but what we've also come to realize in our industry is a lot of seniors. And uh, when I say seniors, people that didn't grow up with technology. So let's say someone that might be 70 or 80 years old. Uh, a lot of times they have to learn to use technology now because if they used to get services, if they used to get medicine, if they used to do those things, they would either do it by mail 
or they would go in person, or they would do it by telephone. Now, a lot of them have to learn how to use computers and technology, but they don't know how to. So one group that we were speaking to recently are veterans. So military people that may have been um, in the military 50 years ago, for example, so they're probably 70, 75 years old now, don't know how to access their health healthcare benefits. They don't know how to access paychecks that are all done electronically. So uh, they have to be taught how to do that. So that's one thing that some of you can do if you want to practice some of these skills is to work with someone in your family or one of your neighbors that may not know how to use technology just to learn how to get comfortable doing it, but also how to do it safely and not click on something they shouldn't. I used to get calls from my mom. Um, she passed away a few years ago, but before then she would call me and say, are you in trouble? I just got a phone call that says that you're in Florida and uh, and you you were arrested for something and that you need money. And I said, mom, that's not me. And she said, are you sure it sounded like it sounded like you? And I said, no, mom, it's not me. So those types of little things could be very expensive or costly for people if they uh, if they think that those are real. So it's important to teach seniors uh, how to do that. Uh, one of the ways to get into this industry that has uh, been interesting, and I, I heard a couple of people in business and accounting and other areas, um, is to do different types of games, to uh, do puzzles, to do, um, I, I like doing Sudoku. So whatever kind of things, like just call them brain teasers. So critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, those are things that are needed in our industry today and for the future. So if any of you have those types of critical thinking skills or or figuring things out without looking it up, how to do it, uh, those are really important things. Or if you learn, know how to look things up, to learn from that and to uh, improve your education. Um, as I mentioned, uh, besides computer science, I happen to have my degree in both uh, economics and Spanish. Um, but it's really interesting when I've spoken to people that have been in my industry for 20 years or more, maybe 25%, maybe one fourth of them came from a technology background. All the rest came from different areas. In fact, one guy that I know that's the head of security at a company here in Chicago was a uh, was an actor and musician. And he just happened to get into it because he was, he needed a job while he was waiting for the next acting gig and was good with computers. So he took a job uh, as a computer tech and did that. And 20 years later, he's running the, the cyber department in this, in this corporation. Uh, the other groups of people that are really good in our industry, besides technology folks, are people that are creative, people that are in arts, music, education. Um, communication, all those types of things, really good skills. One of the things I said to one of uh, the uh, professors before is being able to communicate effectively, whether that's written or verbal, um, it's really important. Uh, so even if you have the technology skills, being able to un speak to your colleagues about what you're working on, being able to explain what the, the good things are, what the problems are within the organization are really important. So those communication skills become very valuable. Um, if people speak foreign languages, that also is really good. It's using a different part of your brain. So you can do a little more critical thinking and problem solving really quickly that others may not be able to do. Um, cybersecurity jobs today. So most of you are familiar with some of these, right? Um, how many of you plan on going into develop software development or coding? Those are really great areas that are going to be needed in the future, but make sure you're learning skills that are not easily replicable. Um, so for example, if you go into chat GPT and you can write the code uh, using an AI tool, you might wanna look at some other things that are not as easy to code. So things that require interesting expertise. Um, when I was younger, mainframe computers were pretty much all they had. Everyone here know what a mainframe is? All right, I spoke to someone recently that didn't know what it was. So um, because uh, of the technology and the access to it, it's uh, finding the code and the development areas that are of interest is really good, but also think that might be your starting point for the next three to five to 10 years. But you might be wanting to round out your skill set for the future so that if that particular um, software development work that you were doing becomes either obsolete or AI takes it over, that you have other skills that, that can be used for the future. Um, security operations centers, system analysts, system engineers, those are all technology areas. Um, being an educator, if you're into communication or education, uh, being a, a, an awareness trainer. I was speaking with someone at a local company 
um, recently, his job is doing cybersecurity awareness, and uh, he's in the cybersecurity department. Sounds really technical what he what his title is, but he at the end of the day, he's a trainer and educator. And uh, it's really fascinating area for him. Ethical hackers. I mentioned that before. Uh, those are people that know how to hack into things and break things, but they also know how to fix them. They can also work for a company that wants to minimize the amount of vulnerabilities and threats that could happen to their company. So protecting their systems with firewalls, with antivirus, with other types of tools mentioned before that I worked for a company with email uh, gateways. Uh, there's a lot of interesting ways to protect systems, but constantly updating your knowledge of these things is extremely important. Um, and uh, I find it fascinating. So speaking to people that used to uh, be hackers, you learn some really cool stuff and uh, uh, learn about people's past, but again, using it for good. Pen testers, anyone know what penetration testing is? Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, incident response, things like that. Those are uh, people that can test systems to see if they have vulnerabilities, whether it's software, whether it's hardware. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, people also do is something called social engineering. Do any of you know what that is? Yeah, one person does. So it's not engineering in the sense that it's technology. It's being able to use other skills to get into things. So for example, you, you may have heard uh, three weeks, four weeks ago, there was a big hotel in Las Vegas that was hacked called MGM Resorts. Um, everyone thinks it was some weird, you know, computer hack or whatever. It wasn't. It was someone calling the help desk with a phone and asking a few questions about how to get passwords for something, saying that they they lost them, they needed to get uh, access to something, and and they were convincing enough that the person forwarded them to the help desk. The help desk people gave them the information they needed, and with that information, they were able to break into the system. No skills whatsoever, but they were able to do what we'll call smooth talking and convince someone that they were the right person. So they got the credentials and were able to hack into the system. So uh, again, there's a lot of different ways to do those types of things. So pen testers um, will actually go and prevent, pretend that they are just walking into a building and seeing, okay, there's a security guard there. There's a receptionist at the company. How do I get past that? Oh, maybe I'll bring them some chocolate or maybe I'll just say hi to them and everything. And then when someone else walks in the door, you just follow them into the door and you go into into the company. There's a lot of interesting ways to do those things. Um, and people are hired to do that. So they might give them a badge or something that makes it look like they belong, but they want to see how how far someone can get into their into their company, whether it's a factory, whether it's other places. So those are interesting jobs to do that again don't require a technology background, but being able to use other other skills that you have. I got into it through a, a sales opportunity and again, changed careers and uh, went back to school for a couple of classes. And uh, there are also ways to uh, get certifications. I don't know if any of you are getting any technology certifications. Those are also really helpful in addition to the schooling and education that you get. So I highly recommend several certifications. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those after about which ones I think are really good for you. And then I'll have some time after this to uh, answer any questions people have as well. Um, as I mentioned, things to be careful of if you're planning on going into software development or coding or things like that, find out um, if those things can be done by AI or by machine learning so that you can be better than the machines or you can do things differently or use uh, languages that you learn in different uh, computing classes so that you can uh, do it better than than a, a single threaded machine can do. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I, I got into this uh, because of sales. I was actually selling chemicals, which has nothing to do with this tech uh, industry. But the uh, thing with sales, whether you work in retail, whether you work in online telephone sales, or whether it's in-person sales, there are certain skills that you develop of being able to talk to people, being able to understand what people are interested in, what what the product or service that you might have offers, and being able to convey that to people. So I use that as my way to get into the industry, but I had to learn enough about the technology to be able to speak intelligently about it. And so it's the same in the sales and the marketing area. You need to understand the technology enough to be able to talk about it, to be able to answer questions so that if someone questions you on things, you can you can respond or you can always say, I'm not sure, let me get back to you, which works 
once with people. You can't do it all the time, but uh, it's a great way also to learn because uh, I know a number of people got into things uh, via telemarketing or telesales, which is answering phones or uh, uh, people call in for new phone service or they call in for cable or they call uh, uh, calling contacting uh, a store to buy something or they're going online and buying something on Amazon or whatever. They have a call center. So um, when people have those types of uh, systems going into sales or being able to answer questions for people, customer service, if you will, are great ways to enter as well. And then you continue to take classes, continue to take certifications, and then you can uh, grow in the industry. You're welcome. Um, I've probably said this more than a few times. Uh, communication is extremely important. Learning how to talk to people, um, learning about new things. Um, that's one of the reasons why I joined uh, the organizations that I belong to in addition to ISSA. Uh, because it's a great way of talking with people, learning how to, uh, learning different, um, let's just say terms. One thing that I noticed, and if any of you want to go to an ISSA meeting, happy to uh, tell you about it. We have an upcoming meeting in November, uh, but we have them almost every month, maybe eight or nine months out of the year. Um, and uh, it's a great way just to listen to what people are talking about and not be intimidated. Uh, because one of the things people say is you use all these weird terms. I'm not familiar with them or use all these abbreviations or what we call acronyms for different things. What do those things mean? And it takes time to learn those things. You're not going to have that information at your fingertips immediately. So it's, it's a learning process. So as I said, whatever job you're going to be doing either now while you're in school or shortly after graduation, chances are you're not going to, going to be doing the exact same thing five or 10 years from now. So learning new technologies, learning new terms is extremely important. Um, just looking here. Yeah, the other thing uh, I mentioned, hallucinations, when AI doesn't give you the right information, and that is uh, you're always going to need people to check on things. I was, uh, I read something about a surgeon uh, or or medical establishment, a hospital that did an automated surgery. I don't know if any of you are aware, but they they have computer generated surgeries now, where if you go in for a routine surgery, they don't have to have a surgeon in the room. It could be done with robots and just have a couple of people uh, in the operating room. And it's, to me, it's kind of scary, but most of the time it works fine. Every now and then there's a mistake. So you do want to make sure there's someone there that they're doing the operation on the right body part that they are doing it uh, appropriately, that uh, that they're uh, doing all the uh, the medicines and the uh, the stitching and all that stuff appropriately. So again, you're going to need people to to keep an eye on those things. Yes. Uh, the one I read about was somewhere else, but it could easily happen here. The good thing with that is, well, the good and the bad thing about that. If you're in a remote area or an area where there aren't 20 hospitals like Chicago has, you may not have too many choices if a lot of people have to go in for surgery um, and there's only one hospital within a you know 50 mile or a 100 kilometer region uh, area there may not be too many options so that's why they have these types of surgeries or if it's a really rare surgery a, re a really rare uh, thing that someone's having done they may not have that specialist so for example if you live in montana or you live in wyoming where they don't have hospitals on it you know 10 hospitals in a city, you may need to have those types of things. But again, you need, should have someone in the room to make sure that's done. When I was younger, the biggest problem that happened in, in medical uh, in a medical setting was someone went in for an operation on one of their legs. I don't know if I remember if it was knee surgery or something similar, they operated on the wrong one. And so that wasn't a technology issue. That was, they just said knee surgery. They got it wrong that it was the right leg versus the left leg. And the person had surgery done to the wrong leg. So you just think about that. So now they have a knee replacement on the one that was good and they still have the bad knee. So that was a big problem. So now the fancy way that they handled that was they just took a pen or a marker and they mark your arm or leg to make sure that they do it. And three more people have to check to make sure it's the same, the right one. So I don't know if any of you have had uh, anything done medically, but it's not unusual for them to mark something or, or read your chart or ask you to repeat things. You're in for the right leg, aren't you? Um, just so that they get that right. Um, for the future, um, 
since you some of you are interested in coding and software development, those are still going to be uh, needed. But again, you're going to want to make sure that uh, you're keeping up on the latest skills, learning new software languages, uh, aligning yourself with companies or technologies that um, are widely used rather than a rare thing. There's a lot of uh, great technologies out there. And there was a company that was here earlier called SAP, has really cool technology uh, based in Europe. And uh, they have some really great uh, systems that they've developed for manufacturing and uh, different types of um, um, factory systems. They also have accounting systems and things like that. So it's integrated between the factories and their accounting systems so they can keep track of things from inventory to, to other areas. Um, making relationships and getting out of your comfort zone. That's something that I can't stress enough. And that is sometimes you think that I just need to know this one little thing and I'll be fine. And unless you're the best at it in the world, chances are you're going to have to have other skills. So um, get out of your comfort zone, learn new skills, learn new technologies, uh, meet new people, join new clubs, whether it's in school or whatever, volunteer. I have that down here as well. Um, I probably have um, in any given time, probably do 10 volunteer projects a year. And it's really important to do that because you can meet someone that might be your future boss or your future spouse. So you never know who you're going to meet when you go out and do these and you find people that like doing things, the same thing that you do. Maybe it's uh, working at a pet rescue place. Maybe it's working in a, in a kitchen um, you, or working in a community garden. You never know where you're going to meet people and have a conversation you're like, oh, they work at such and such company. And that's a really cool thing. I'm, I should probably get to know them a little better. Um, and you do find some really cool people when you do things like that. Uh, the bottom one, and I'll mention it again later, um, how many of you are graduating this year? Let's just say in December or June. Do any of you have do any of you have jobs lined up for when you graduate? No. Okay. Now is the time to start applying. So maybe not wait till after Halloween, but in the next few weeks, start applying. Um, I have two kids. Uh, one of them got her job um, after she graduated because she did an internship the previous summer. And they wanted to keep her. So it worked out really well. Uh, my son, not so much. Um, he changes majors a couple of times, finished graduating on time, but he had to take a lot of extra classes in his third and fourth year to make up for that. Um, but as a result, he never looked for a job until two weeks, three weeks before graduation and said, oh, I probably need to find a job. He couldn't find one for a while, so he had to do other jobs throughout the summer, and he didn't get his full-time job until November. So he went six months doing different part-time jobs, which was fine because it was a way for him to learn, and he learned some new skills while he was doing it because he took an Excel class. He did all these other things, which helped round out his uh, skill set, but he was not as prepared. So a word of caution, do it four months, six months in advance. It, it's really helpful. Um, those of you that are not graduating, um, have any of you done internships or summer jobs? Might want to consider doing that as well. So now's a good time. I was speaking with someone that works uh, at a corporation downtown. I'll mention their name, but um, they work at McDonald's, but not the restaurant. McDonald's happens to be headquartered in Chicago. And so they work at their downtown headquarters office. And uh, she said that they are starting to take applications for summer jobs in November. So November, December, January, by the end of January, they have all their summer jobs filled up. So regardless of where you want to work, whatever type of job, and if it's not the job you really want, it doesn't matter because you're just, it's one, earning some money, hopefully. Number two, learning a new skill. Number three, working with new people. And lastly, is you're learning something that you might be able to use down the road, or you might find out, hey, I'm studying a particular subject, but I really like this other thing I was doing. And then you might want to change into something like that or find a way to combine those two skills. Like if you're an artist, you might go into software development, but more uh, um, digital arts, you know, so where you're doing creative things with your art background. So um, different ways of learning skills. So again, if you're looking at getting a job after graduation, start looking way before. But uh, for those of you that aren't graduating in the next uh, nine months, uh, look for internships or summer jobs to do next year. It's really important. Um, what to do in the meantime. Um, so I, I put some fun things up here just because I'm a little goofy. 
uh, but that is uh, focus on other things besides school. Focus on other things besides work. Uh, if it's your family, if it's your siblings, if it's your friends, do do fun things um, and try to break up all the hard stuff that you have to do. You know, whether it's homework, whether it's studies, whether it's work. You know, a lot of you are working jobs uh, and going to school at the same time, which is really hard. But take a little time for yourself and have some fun. It's really important. And again, it you might f- meet some new people or find new ways or get some different ideas of things to do. Um, education. I, you're all going to NEIU. I think education is great. Being a continuous learner, I'm I'm an old person, but I still go back to school and take classes. Um, I find it's really important to continue to learn. It keeps your mind sharp. It keeps your um, uh, eyes open to other things. And you never know, you might find something that you like that way. Uh, networking and meeting new people. I said that before. Um, I can't stress that enough. You never know who you're going to meet. I was speaking with someone that was in the military um, and he was working out at a health club and he was just doing weights and stuff like that. Um, and this other person was sitting there and they were doing a bench press, which is the one where you lay down and you pump the, the weights like this. Um, and uh, the person asked him and they said, could you help me? The, the term is used, uh, that they use is spotting me so that they didn't drop the weight back on them. So the person stood behind them and made sure that they had enough strength to lift the bar up and down. Uh, and they did their 10 repetitions, whatever they were doing. And the person thanked them after and said, you know, what's your name? You know, what do you do? And he told them who he was and his name. And uh, he said, he told them who he was. And it turned out it was not just his superior officer in the military. It wasn't his boss's boss. It was the head of the the, the uh, ba- army base that they were at. And uh, because of that, he developed this little bit of a friendship. He couldn't be friends with him because of the, the rank difference, but they knew each other. So when he was done, he, cause he would go to the gym and continue to see the guy, the guy said, what do you, what do you, uh, what's your, um, what do you do in the military? He told him. Um, and he said, uh, I'm also going back to school. And he said, what are you studying? He said, computer science. And he said, what are you planning on doing with that? He goes, I'm not really sure. You know, and the guy said, well, in addition to the military, I also work at a company and they're always looking for software developers and technology people. And because of that meeting, he was able to get a job after graduation, worked there for two years and then went on from there. So it's, again, really important to network and meet with people, being creative, doing art, music, learning new skills, playing an instrument. Any of you play an instrument? I thought it would have been more. What instrument do you play? Clarinet and saxophone? Which do you prefer? Oh, okay. I played saxophone. That's why I asked. And what a what instrument? And bassoon. I've never met someone that plays a bassoon. That has two S's, two O's, right? Okay. It's a cool instrument. Maybe you two should start a band. Uh, but music is is really important. Dancing, believe it or not, again, anything with rhythm or um, music is very mathematical. Uh, most people don't realize that, but um, it plays really well to the technology space. Uh, volunteering, I mentioned before, certifications. Any of you have any technology certifications or accounting certifications outside of your classwork? I, I recommend you consider doing that too. So if it's technology, uh, there's a lot of different coding certs that you can get for different languages. Um, I work at a company that has probably 20 different certifications that one could get if they want to be a specialist in that area. Um, I put up a couple here that are important in my industry, Network Plus and Security Plus. Most of these are either really low cost. When I say like low cost, like $500 to get the certification. So to take the class and to take the exam, but there's a lot of scholarship money out there. There's companies that will pay for that. There are organizations that will pay for that. Um, so if you do volunteer work at that organization and they happen to have a, a reimbursement program or scholarship program for certification classes or exams or things like that, really important to know that because why should you spend the $500 to do it if someone else will pay it, pay for it? But you might have to do a little bit of volunteer time to make up for that. But more often than not, it's very well worth it once you get one certification You'll probably want to get a second one, kind of like you learn one instrument, you want to learn another one. But um, it, it's uh, extremely important. So regardless of what your degree is in, if you go and looking for jobs and five other people are trying to get that same job or 50 other people are trying to get that same job, if you have a certification or you showed uh, expertise in a particular area, it's extremely valuable and differentiates you 
from other people. So I highly recommend you consider getting certifications or look at other things you can get above and beyond what you're learning in the classroom. LinkedIn, how many of you use LinkedIn or have a LinkedIn profile? One, two, okay, good. If it was only one, I was gonna get a little worried. Um, really important to have that exposure and start building that network. And that doesn't mean adding all your friends and go, oh, I have a hundred people on LinkedIn and they're all your friends. That might be good if if you wanna use them for, for work purposes and networking or people that you're studying with. But a lot of times people just put their friends on there. It's not Facebook. It's not Instagram. You know, it's not a way to get a certain number of likes. It's you want to build a, uh, a network of relationships for your career or for whatever it is that you you enjoy doing that's not social or, or things like that. So I know they call it social media, but um, LinkedIn is one that I happen to really think highly of for a business, regardless of whether you want to go into technology or engineering, you want to go into accounting, you want to go into economics, business, any of those things. Uh, extremely important. If any of you have questions on that, I'm happy to answer them. But I think there's also going to be a career day uh, in two or three weeks um, that they'll probably be talking about um, resume writing, talking about LinkedIn profiles, things like that. Find out how it is, how you should best build that profile. And you can always change it, but you want to make sure you put uh, a picture out there. I know some people don't have their picture, have a picture. And if you want it just to be you, great. You want to have it with something fun that you like to do. Like you're sitting at a piano or, 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 uh, you know, out with your friends or whatever, that's fine. You just want to make sure people can see who you are. Um, but also tell them more about you, not just that I'm going to NEIU or that I graduated with a degree in something, uh, but put other things on there that you speak other languages, that you belong to certain clubs, that you um, do volunteer work. All those things are extremely important on your LinkedIn profile, not just I went to school and here's my GPA. So uh, those are really important. And with that, I will say thank you and open it up to questions. And if you need me to go back to any of the slides, I'm happy to, but uh, throw your questions at me. I'm happy to answer. Yes. In this, in cybersecurity or other, it, it, find out from people that are in that industry what certifications are important, which ones are either the most highly valued, not that they cost the most, but that the industry recognizes as being the most important, or which ones are easier to attain, because sometimes it's better to start uh, at a lower level, cert, get one or two certifications and build up your skill set, and then you could take a more advanced one. So for example, in my industry, there's one called the CISSP, and I don't have it. I have never needed it, but it requires knowledge in 10 different disciplines. And the test is a six-hour test with 200 questions, and you have to get at least 80% correct. And most people take it three, four, five times. And every time you take it, it's several hundred dollars. Um, but there are 15 other certs, certifications that you get before that, that are just as important. And if you get four or five of those or two of those, let's say, um, you may not need that CISSP or you get the CISSP five years later after you've been working and you learn a lot of things on the job that you may not have learned from school or reading the book. So that type of knowledge of just uh, being experiential learning, if you call it, um, is very important. So find out whatever industry that you're going into, find out from people that are in that industry, what are the certifications that they think are the best for you. Okay, because I've done, um, I've looked into it and I've seen like LinkedIn actually has uh, offers some like skills, um, skill building that like, I think I think they offer a little course and then you could take like a, a mini test. I believe Google also has. Google something. does, LinkedIn does, um, Coursera. I don't know if you ever have used that. Um, there's some really cool certification programs you can take through those, but use those as supplements to your education, not to replace them because uh, having the degree will be very important, but you may also find that um, there are other areas you want to go into. So again, once you start in a workplace and you're doing something for a couple of years, you may find out that you like doing what the person in the next room is doing more than what you're doing. So uh, it's good to round out your, your knowledge base on that. But any of those certifications that are available, especially if they're free and, and they're credible, 
absolutely do them. What's the worst that happens? You spend some time studying, right? Not a bad thing. You're welcome. Other questions? I knew you had a handheld microphone. I would have walked around and talked to people. So um, you were talking about um, jobs in general. I mean, like you should apply, like for graduate, like who's ever graduating, they should apply a few months before. Um, how about if you're thinking that uh, if you're getting um, a job, I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, you're like, if they're if you even apply for a job and then they would still then they would immediately ask you did you get your diploma you know because they're always a question say that did you get your diploma or you graduate or a graduate student already and all that so my question would be like should I still like apply still or after because you know or not after that because I mean it might take some progress I we I get that point one hundred percent apply for it the the worst they can do is say no. That that's number one. Number two is a lot of people don't think that they have skills that they do or don't have the confidence to think that they can do a job. And yes, it may say there are 10 requirements for this job and you don't have four of them. Still apply for the job. It, it, sometimes they, they, I was going to use the term phishing, but not the cyber phishing, but they're phishing to find out how you're going to respond. So there's a plus and a minus to if you've already graduated. If you've already graduated and it's been six months, they be, may be wondering why didn't they get a job before? Why'd they wait till now? Whereas you're being proactive and saying, I'm, I haven't graduated yet. I'm graduating in December or in May or whatever. Um, and that you're anxious to be looking now. And the other thing that is really important, you may have to go on 20 interviews before you get the job. And whether it's done virtually or in person, every interview you do is practice. So I, I went on interviews at companies that I had no interest in working for. And, and people would say, why are you doing that? Because it was practice. I could make all the mistakes I wanted because I had no interest in that job. But I could say something stupid. I could try something new that I would not normally do in an interview for a job I really wanted because I didn't want to seem stupid. Um, so you do things like that. It's a great test case, great test market to try something out. And the worst that happens is they say, yes, we want to hire you. And you're like, nah, I'm not interested. Or you may say, I'll try it, but um, it's a way to to practice your skills and, and learn new things. Other questions? Oh yeah, so it, it's really funny. He didn't have a job right after school. Um, it took him two, two and a half months to get a job. He did a part-time job. Uh, when I say part-time, it was uh, 40 hours a week but it was for six months. It was a six month job. Um, and afterwards they said, we'd like to keep you for another six months. And he said, I really don't like what I'm doing. So uh, he was applying for other jobs this time, three months ahead of time before the six months expired. And he ended up getting a job. He's still at that same company. So, and he's been there five and a half years. Yeah. Three different jobs. So he changes, changes it up because as I said, you may not like what you're doing when you first do the, you. So Two or three things I recommend. One is find an, a company or an industry or a school that you want to work at, regardless of what your job, you know, depending what you're trying to get. What, where do I want to work? And that includes geographically. That includes commuting time. Uh, that includes the type of company that you want to work for because you think there's a lot of other opportunities there. Um, and go into it with the knowledge I'm going to work there for one or two years with the hope of finding other jobs within the company. So let's say you want to, um, just because I used the example before, you want to work at McDonald's corporate headquarters, but you don't want to be doing the first job that you get. You'll find out all these other jobs that you get there. It could be United Airlines. You know, there are 20, let's say 500 different jobs you could do at United Airlines. Get your foot in the door at United Airlines if that's where you want to work. And then you could move to other areas. So to use the example with my son, he's on his third job in five and a half years. So every two years, roughly, he does something different. And it's good because the company gives him the opportunity to do that. Um, my daughter has uh, been in the same place now for a year and a half. Her previous job was for a year and she couldn't wait to leave. So it really, she thought it was her dream job. And she got there and after five or six months, she said, I really don't like this. I don't like the company. I don't like what I'm doing. So she, she had to change, but uh, 
it's really important to find, as I said, the company or the industry that you like. So let's say you have an accounting degree. Um, you can do that at any type of organization, but you might want to gravitate towards a certain industry because you have either a certain personal affinity to certain industries, or you think it's a really cool place where there might be future jobs and opportunities for you. So uh, those are important. The last thing that's really important is working with people you like. So for example, if you um, are doing volunteer work or you're working at an internship, summer job, and uh, you find there's some really cool people that you work with or that you volunteered with that work at a different company, you might want to find out, are there jobs at that company? And that would be a really fun person to work with. And uh, so not only people that you work with, but having a manager or a boss that you like is really important because I've worked in a few jobs where I really didn't like my boss. Like I'd come home and I won't say I was in tears, but I definitely wanted to yell. Um, so those are not good environments either. So you want to work at a place where you're wanted, feel valued, and that you go to work being happy and you come home being happy. So uh, those are also important. So think about those things when you're looking at jobs going, yeah, I could take that job, but is it really where I want to be working? Or say, yeah, I can do that for a year and see how it goes. And maybe it'll surprise me. Maybe it'll be different than I expected. Yeah. And having work experience before you get your first job after graduation is really important. So then you kind of know what you like and don't like. You know, you don't want to work in a certain type of office or you don't want to do work virtually or you want to work virtually, but only two days a week. Those are important things to ask when you're interviewing too. And uh, you're not asking because you don't want the job. You're asking because that's what you prefer. And they'll probably ask you that too. You know, this job is hybrid. So you could be in in the office or out of the office or in the in the lab or out of the lab. Do you have a preference? And one thing to ask is what is their preference? rather than answering because uh, you want to kind of leave a little bit of option. They might say, well, we'd like people to come in three days a week. And you're like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. You look like you have questions. No? Okay, then you have answers. So we should come to you for answers. Any other questions? Any other hobbies people have? Okay, we heard piano, bassoon, clarinet, and saxophone. By the way, is it alto or tenor sax? And soprano? Yeah, I happen to play ten. I, I used to play tenor sax. It's been a long time. Um, any other interests or hobbies people have that might be able to lead to a job or a career? No? Well, then get a hobby. Get something that makes you happy. You know, like I said, gardening, anything with pets, animals, um, cooking really cool things to do. Or um, those of you that have not already signed up or aren't planning on going, there is a career day on November, I think 16th. Is that right? Yeah. Try and come to that because it's a great way to meet people and, and learn about the different skills that you might need or certifications that are helpful. Hopefully there'll be people there helping with uh, LinkedIn profiles and resume writing and things like that. So again, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.